Hi there everyone, welcome back to Life After Neverland. I'm so grateful that you're here today. I appreciate you joining me as we cover the Bible study, the final Nephilim. We're currently on chapter six, the return of the Antichrist. This chapter is very, very lengthy. So I wanna say thank you for joining me. I hope you'll stick with me on this. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take small bite-sized portions of this chapter. Probably we're gonna be working on this chapter for several weeks. And the topic we're gonna to discuss specifically today is, or the person I should say, is Nimrod himself. And what we're doing here is we're kind of talking about different leaders, men in the Bible who had an antichrist spirit, one in which we've said many times that there's nothing new under the sun. And so it's really fascinating to see the progression through the history of the Bible and to see where we're at right now. And so I wanna ask you, if you're coming to my channel for the very first time, are you wondering what's going on in this world? Maybe you've heard some things in the Bible that kind of resonate with some of the things that you're seeing, or maybe you just need a little bit of hope. Well, you are in the right place. The Lord told us that the things that we're seeing right before our eyes currently right now were going to happen. It's in the book of Revelation, if you don't know that already. And it just so happens that we covered the book Revealing Revelation, which dives into the book of Revelation and helps us understand some of the really interesting topics that they discuss in relation to the end times, which we currently live in. Uh, I wanted to give a great big hug to those of you that were very supportive of me over the last two weeks. I have been, I feel, you know, I do feel like we are in a spiritual war, and I think a lot of that comes to us spiritually, though we might see it in the physical world, but we also feel it internally. And I've, I've been having a lot of things happen that I feel like we're trying to derail me and make my life more complicated. And um, I decided that I'm gonna keep pushing forward. I was about ready to just give up ship and say I just can't do this anymore. Um, and also YouTube, just literally I feel suppressing what I'm saying because I talk about Israel, I talk about the Bible, <laughs> I talk about Amir Sarfati, so uh, all the things that, that like to be suppressed. And unfortunately, YouTube is the one channel that I use the most because I don't go on all these other social media outlets. I am a real estate photographer in my actual life and uh, it's just too much to do all of that. So those of you that take the time to follow me, hit the like button, uh, write beautiful, sweet, kind, loving messages to me to help support me through some of these battles. Um, I can't say thank you enough. And I greatly appreciate you more than you could ever know. Uh, some of you I haven't even spoken to at all and you stepped in and just to give me a little boost and it was very much appreciated. Okay, so uh, through this video, I, I wanted to give you a couple clips that I found throughout the last couple of weeks that resonate in what we're talking about. You know, different biblical scholars, prophecy scholars, uh, have basically been talking about and parroting what we're actually currently learning. And so I'm going to give you one clip right now before we get started. So Paul is telling us here that that spirit, there was a demonic power behind this, was already at work in his day that was causing problems. It was causing trouble. It was causing upheaval, wickedness, immorality. I believe that spirit has been on the earth since the days of Noah and the day it, when the sons of God, the B'nai Elohim, the angels, when they went into the daughters of men, and they bore those giants, those Nephilims, and, and, they, and they covered the earth. The Bible says the whole earth was filled with violence. And, and again, we pointed this out. The Hebrew word there for violence is Hamas. And the whole earth was filled with this. So remember, what did, uh, what did Jesus say? In, I believe it's in Luke 17. As it were in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the return of the Son of Man. Watch this. So listen, if you want to know, people are like, oh, well, brother. And they ask me this all the time. Well, what do you believe are signs that we are close to this thing wrapping up? What are signs that we're close to the end time, the end of the age, and the rapture of the church and the coming of the Lord? I believe based on Daniel 9, 27, Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, all the way back to the book of Genesis. Again, I believe the three main themes, Jerusalem, the temple, 
and this spirit of iniquity, lawlessness, violence will converge together and it will increase like birth pangs of the Messiah. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and tag each video, the clip I should say, but I'll put the whole entire length of each video. I'll give you the links in the description section if you find what I posted to be interesting and you'd like to hear the whole entire message. Okay, so we are talking about the return of the Antichrist. As I said, we're on chapter six and it says here, Revelation 17, which is what we're specifically gonna be talking about and diving into, contains one of the most mysterious passages in the Bible as it details seven incarnations of the Antichrist through time. The spirit of the Assyrian has been permitted to indwell certain notorious figures throughout biblical history. And some of the key themes we will be discussing in the next few weeks, the Antichrist has been on the earth before and has incarnated five times by the writing of Revelation. The sixth indwelling took place during the life of the Apostle John, the Revelator. The seventh was to come in the future, reign for a short period, and give way to the eighth, the Antichrist. All of these satanic mystery kings gave clear evidence that they were a part of the satanic spiritual lineage leading to the last king, the final Nephilim. Just to get a little context here, let's read Revelation 17, 10 through 11. So go ahead and pull up your Bible and read along with me. Thanks. <laughs> Five kings have already fallen. The sixth now reigns and the seventh is yet to come, but his reign will be brief. The scarlet beast that was, but is no longer, is the eighth king. He is like the other seven and he too is headed for destruction. So let's unpack that just a little bit. It says here in the book, scripture establishes Jesus Christ as he that is and was and is to come. The final Nephilim is he that was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Thus, unlike Jesus, who has existed continually, the Antichrist has lived in the past, then died and will later return to earth. The seven kings represent incarnations of this angelic being throughout biblical history. Ryan Peterson, the author of this book, he wants us to point out an author named Peter Good Goodgame, and he explained this concept in one of his books, Red Moon Rising, and he said this, the seven heads of Satan that are also shown as seven heads of the beast are explained as being seven kings. There are seven satanic kings that ruled on the earth during different periods in history, and they have all been enemies of God each possessing a blasphemous name. The seventh king would then be followed by the Antichrist himself, who would be the eighth, but also the seven. John wrote the book of Revelation, and by this time, five of these mystery kings had died. One of them, the sixth, was alive at the time of the writing of the book. The seventh was not yet come, but would come only for a short space. And the beast, the Antichrist, would be the eight, but of the seven, and ultimately going to perdition. What this complex passage is stating is that the Antichrist has existed before. And there's a huge glare from my computer, so <laughs> let me fix that. Okay, we got it fixed. <laughs> Sorry. So this is something that really hit a chord with me in the book. And so I highlighted it, so I'm gonna read it for you. Okay. The fallen angel known as the Assyrian, Abaddon and Apollyon has indwelled other people in the past. And during the day of the Lord, in the days of the great tribulation, he will make one final appearance as the end times antichrist. And so now going back to the Bible study, it says here the Assyrian, and if, if you guys are confused as to why I'm using the word Assyrian, if you're just now joining me, you're gonna to have to go back um, to the beginning when I first started uh, the study, so, so it'll all come together for you. The Assyrian, the fallen angel who will indwell and possess the body of the Antichrist was initially banished 
to the abyss, where he remained chained under darkness with the rest of the Genesis 6 rebel angels. However, he has been permitted to emerge from the abyss throughout biblical history and indwell certain notorious figures. This is confirmed in Revelation 17, 7 through 11. So let's go ahead and read all of that so that you can get the whole visual. Now we just read Revelation 17, 10 through 11. So we're just going to add a little bit extra. Okay, go back up and repeat just a, a smidge, okay? Why are you so amazed, the angel asked. I will tell you the mystery of this woman and the beast with seven heads and ten horns on which she sits. The beast you saw was once alive, but isn't now, and yet he will soon come up out of the bottomless pit and go to eternal destruction. And the people who belong to this world, whose names were not written in the book of life before the world was made, will be amazed at the reappearance of this beast who had died. This calls for a mind with understanding. The seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. They also represent seven kings. Five kings have already fallen. The sixth now reigns and the seventh is yet to come, but his reign will be brief. The scarlet beast that was, but is no longer, is the eighth king. He is like the other seven, and he too is headed for destruction. Now, if you want more in depth about some of the other aspects of that piece of scripture, of course, you'd want to look at my Revealing Revelation Bible study because that it dives in a lot more about the woman and, and all of that other extra. Essentially, what these complex passages are saying is that the Antichrist has existed before. Okay, just we already said that, but I'm just, you know, wrapping it up in a boat. You understand, right? Okay. So now let's discuss Nimrod, all right? He's our first mystery king. Nimrod was the first leader to be indwelled by the spirit of the Assyrian, AKA the Antichrist. His name in Hebrew means, let us rebel. And in his career, he exemplified satanic revolt against the creator. He was the leader of the Tower of Babel Rebellion an attempt to create a one world government and open a portal to the heavenly realm. Now, let me go ahead and pull up Genesis 11, one through four to confirm that for you. This specifically talks about the Tower of Babel and it goes on to say, at one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone and tar was used for mortar. Then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. Now, I'm not going to show it here, but I did recently, just actually this morning, listen to a biblical study by one of my favorite pastors, John Barnett, and he was talking about learning the Bible in 60 minutes. He was basically talking about how the lineage of Jesus was constantly being stained and um, there was a demise always pushing against anything that Jesus was trying to do, anything that God was trying to do in order to uh, push forward his plan, especially the purity of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ the first time and the second time. So it's very interesting to listen to 60 minutes, like a crash course of how Jesus has been planned to be a part of humanity in order to save humanity. And yet Satan keeps trying so hard to soil it. It's really fascinating. And it's kind of what we're dealing with now. If you really think about it, if you open up your eyes, you'll see that anything that has to do with God is being worked against. And you'll also realize that it isn't just recently and it isn't just the Holocaust itself that caused the Jewish people to be persecuted. It's been happening all through biblical history prior to even the Holocaust. That should say a lot. 
Okay, so I'm gonna move on though. But just keep those things in your mind. It's important to know this. It's life altering and that's why you need to know all of this. And that's why I'm gonna keep pushing forward no matter how many times I get exasperated, not only with myself or life in, in general. The biblical description of this ancient despot draws connection to the Nephilim. In Genesis 10, eight through nine, it states, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Three times the passage above refers to Nimrod as mighty or Gaborim in Hebrew. The precise term used to describe the Nephilim in Genesis 6, who were mighty men which were of old, men of renown. That's pulled from Genesis 6-4, if you want to pull that up and read that on your own, but I'm going to keep moving on, but I just want to let you know that so that you can pull that up and read it so you have a reference, okay? It is also a term used to describe fighters with superhuman combat ability. And it says here in the book here, our study guide, see the descriptions of King David's mighty men in 2 Samuel 23 or Joshua's warriors in Joshua 8. So feel free to go ahead and jot that down, make some notes, go back and take a peek for yourself. Just for the sake of time, I'm gonna keep pushing forward here. Examining the same passage on Nimrod and the Septuagint brings us even closer to the days of Noah. In Genesis 10, 8, 9, it states, And Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a giant upon the earth. He was a giant hunter before the Lord God. Therefore, they say, as Nimrod, the giant hunter before the Lord. The Septuagint calls Nimrod a giant. And with his aspirations to rule over the world, usurp earth and heaven and form a one world government. Sound familiar? It is not a surprise that he would be the first candidate for the fallen angelic Assyrian to possess. Micah chapter five contains a prophecy of Jesus's impending conquest of the Antichrist. Micah five, five through six. And this man, speaking of the Messiah, shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land and when he shall tread into our palaces. Then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men and they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod and the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. Here, the connection through time is established as the prophecy reveals that the second advent Messiah shall destroy the Assyrian and the land of the Nimrod. Now, as I mentioned, we're gonna keep it brief today as we're gonna cover several men who have been influenced by the Antichrist prior in biblical history. But I wanted to read to you some notes that I made in the book that weren't covered specifically in the study itself about Nimrod. One of the things here, it says, he was the first murderer and conqueror of the post-flood world. He was the founder of the city of Babylon, which became the center of pagan satanic idolatry, many versions of which featured Nimrod himself being worshiped as a god. His name, which we talked about before, means to rebel or let us rebel, indicated his disposition. He was an enemy of God and Satan's main servant on earth at that time. He was credited with leading the effort to build the Tower of Babel, a religious temple of worship for false gods and the first attempt to form global government, which that kind of sums up a lot of what we just discussed, but just gives you a little bit more. This was, I think, from Alex Jones, you know, guy who runs InfoWars super controversial conspiracy theorist type figure yet he talks about a lot of things that end up coming to pass and he this was like an expose that he did where he actually went he wore a camera or he had a camera with him went undercover and actually filmed this sort of ritual happening in the woods now let me tell you when you look at this ritual does this not look like something that happened uh back in the days 
of the children of Israel when they were commanded by God not to do the same rituals and perform the same sacrifices that the neighboring nations did. There's nothing new under the sun, guys. Here's what I want to tell you. The same spirit that people worshipped back then, that people, the pagans worshipped back uh, in the days of ancient Israel, those same spirits are around today. They're eternal beings, and they still demand worship. They give you, they overpromise and underdeliver. What happens if you worship them? They'll give you like money and fame, but at the expense of your soul. And we're seeing this happen today. And what's really crazy is why is it why is it happening with all these famous people? Why is it happening with people in the entertainment industry? Why is it happening with people in politics? Why is it happening with people in big business? Another portion of the book, it says, was Nimrod and Nephilim. Um, we talk about the word Gaborim. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that word correctly. Uh, I, I struggle sometimes with some of these. But anyways, what does that actually mean? It, it means that they're superhuman. They have their, he said he was a mighty warrior. His fighting ability is essentially a superhuman. Uh, some of the things that I like to share with you that we have currently going on today, what do we know about that in our day and time? AI. AI is going to be the new superhuman. And they're already, there is one person that had a chip put in their brain where they can actually move things with their mind. I'm sorry, like I said this before, but it's just kind of like... Is there any test about the psychology of this person? I don't think that should ever be put in any human whatsoever. Because what's going to happen? If they can do things that no other human can do. How can you possibly not have an ego when you can literally do things that no one else can do? Ridiculous. All right, anyways, it says here, um, again, it says Nimrod was the first of the post-flood Gaborim, far exceeding his contemporaries in combat. Although that would not necessarily mean he was a Nephilim giant, it is clear that he was so imposing and so dominant in warfare that he was the starkest reminder of the giants who once terrified humanity with their weapons of war. Just other things to note is that the Tower of Babel Rebellion was the earliest corporate assault against the Lord recorded after the flood and it represented the effort to establish a global governance and that's repeated over and over again and i think it's simply because look at where we are right now they are literally pushing if this doesn't resonate in your mind or make you kind of go hmm do you remember that song i don't know if it was in the 90s the things that make you go hmm global government is being pushed right now and it's being built that's called the beast system it's being built right now and if you don't see it, I just encourage you to look into it if you don't see it right now. That's alarming to me if you don't see that, but I just, I would like for you to try to open your eyes. I'm saying that with love. It also says here that I made note of to talk to you guys about was that it says, rather than spreading out to replenish the planet, like, cause that's what God wanted the people to do after the flood was to spread out. Think about this right now. Nimrod consolidated the global population in one city dedicated to pagan worship. So for me, the reason why I highlighted that is because what I see happening in the world right now, they're talking about 15 minute cities. Does anybody really want that? I surely don't. I wanna travel the world. I'm, I'm an adventurer. I wanna do fun, adventurous things. Already I feel very, um, confined to where I am because of the state of the world which we live in right now I don't really feel all that safe okay but now what they want to do and, and, we, and I'm gonna play something about that right now the 15 minute cities I'm, I'm literally gonna play that after we speak and leave that with you for today okay so that you know that I'm not just like randomly talking about stuff that I just pulled out of nowhere okay uh, other pastors are talking about it and it's a true wake-up call yeah. They want to take away that freedom of movement. That's what the idea is, to control us like little ants and stuff like that. Now, now think about this. This goes back to the Tower of Babel. Again, every time you see what they're doing, think Tower of Babel. They're returning to the Tower of Babel. So Nimrod was clumping everyone up in together all as a, as a city so they can do their consensus building, groupthink type of thing. And, and, and then he wasn't permitting them to move because he was scaring them 
with a narrative. Okay? Now, here's the funny thing is, it doesn't matter what the narrative is, because there, there's uh, the, 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 the oral tradition, even Josephus notes uh, this, and we get hints of this in, in, in Genesis, that, that Nimrod was selling the, the, the fear factor that, look, we have got to clump up together because this God that destroyed all of humanity in a flood may do it again. And so if we're not going to obey him and spread out. We have to group up together because that's where we're going to find our, our security is with one another. Uh, it's kind of the same thing, the, the slogan, we're stronger with diversity. Remember, have you heard that, slur, that slogan? So we need to clump up together and stay inclusive and stay together and not do what this, this God that killed everybody in the flood does. And, and, and so um, we stay in a little 15-minute city in Nimrod, with Nimrod. That, that's really what it was. And so when you see this, it's the same thing. It's the same concept. Um, now, here's another commercial for this, this cul-de-sac living. Hi, I'm Kim Mai Cutler. I'm a partner at Initialize Capital. Did you know that only 8% of Americans live in walkable neighborhoods? What that means from a livability perspective is you've got to drive everywhere to get anything that you want done. In 2018, Initialize invested in a company called Cul-de-Sac that has sought to turn the entire notion of car dependency on its head. They've done this by building one of the very first car-free neighborhoods that this country has probably seen in decades. We're here in Tempe, Arizona, which is just east of Phoenix, to see their first community. Come with me and let's take a walking tour to check it out. What kind of residents and people are attracted to living here? So we see a wide variety of folks interested in car-free living. Really, in wide general, variety. I think it's folks Look at who the want that campus environment. Wide variety. Social uh, sort of feel with, you know, life lived not through a windshield. So they want to have a grocery store right next to their apartment. Maybe they're working from home. Maybe they're already getting around by bike and they're looking for a place that will have, you know, bike parking indoor, outdoor, with charging stations all around. I think we've seen a lot of demand for it, and there's just not a lot of options to live that way in the United States right now. What's changing in the broader Tempe Phoenix area to enable e-bikes and this type of living? So the light rail investment was massive. You can get to downtown Mesa, downtown Phoenix, hundreds of thousands of jobs by the light rail. We've also now got Waymo directly to cul-de-sac Tempe. Uh, and so this is the largest autonomous vehicle zone active in the world right now. And on top of that, Tempe, Phoenix, so many of these cities are making great investments in bicycle infrastructure. Safe, protected, painted lanes so that our residents can get around in a variety of ways. And so there's a lot of freedom in mobility coming to oh, Metro it's Phoenix. It's the right opposite. Thursday nights, um, when the weather's nice, uh, we throw an event called Little Choya, where we have small business vendors, live music, food trucks. Uh, we've done in this plaza right here a little roller rink. We've got vintage markets, people selling all sorts of things. But it's really exciting how we're layering all these different vibrant aspects of a community into this space here. It's not just the big retail, it's not just the gym or the plazas or the courtyards, it's also the events that we throw, the partners we have, the small businesses who come here every Thursday Hill in the spring and fall. Yeah. There's a lot to living in cul de sac County. Awesome. Wow. So it's the opposite of what he said. It's not freedom. It's, it's enslavement. That's what it is. It's a techno enslavement w without walls is basically what we have. So okay. with all of that being said, you guys, I, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for joining me. Next week, we're going to cover Pharaoh during Exodus, and he's mystery king number two. So next week, we're going to cover Pharaoh. And I do want to tell you about the spiritual battle that I'm going through. I had someone come to my house, a handyman. I had to leave and go outside for just a little bit. I was currently working on one of my prior studies, and this happened. This is my study guide. My dogs chewed up my study guide. Now, my dogs don't usually act crazy, and I was talking to one of my, my dear friends. Her name is Michelle. Uh, she always watches all of these these vlogs and she was basically saying that you know there can be spirits that are pushed forward through satan that try to mess with you and throw you off your game 
and these types of things have been happening. So those of you that have been praying for me, I just want to say thank you. And it's greatly appreciated, actually. I take it very seriously. But what's really wild about this is that they chewed all the way up to chapter 6 which is the one that we're currently working on. So thank you, Jesus. <laughs> he had my back. <laughs> and way more things happened since that. Um, I, 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 This is crazy. This has never happened. My dog, Enzo, he's my buddy. And we always go everywhere together. And whenever I go on my real estate photo shoots, sometimes I'll bring him just for safety. I brought him with me. I have a new car because my other car ate it. It literally ate it. By the grace of God, I was able to pull over to safety, but the car was donezo. So I have a new car and Enzo had diarrhea in my car. He threw up one time, then I went to go get him water after I'd already cleaned up the diarrhea in the car. I'm, I'm in the middle of a photo shoot here with a professional who wanted to see my dog and I'm like, oh, how can I do this without her seeing and smelling the fact that he literally took a deuce in my car. So. After we left and I was able to like be sneaky and not let her realize that that had happened, he puked, went to the store, I cleaned all that up, gave him some water, and then he projectile vomited all over me, all over, like my whole entire car was completely contaminated and I had two hours to get home with all of that in my car. <laughs> ah, completely paranoid as if maybe Enzo might puke again. So, but he's good. I took him to the vet and my, my friend actually told me, um, her husband is, is the vet. They're, they're my dear friends. She told me that there is a virus going around for dogs right now. That's unheard of that they have never seen before, but by the grace of God, by the grace of God, Enzo is doing well. He didn't have, he had all the tests. He was clear of all of that. And so I just wanted to let you know, cause I know a lot of you really like Enzo a lot. Um, and so do I. But anyways, with all that being said, thank you so much for joining me. I will see you guys next week. And if you have it in your heart to do so, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. I would truly love it because I'd love for you to hang out with me a little bit longer. I do want to share uh, the Lord with others. And if you do too, and you like what I have to say, I'd love it if you would share with other people. And not because I need any, any uh, glory or anything like that, but just simply because of the time in which we live. And I do feel like the Lord is going to be coming very, very, very soon. <laughs> God bless you guys. Be safe in the storm out there. And I will talk to you next 